uh, this is next one is all online. Um, gamification of training and emerging acquisition methods. Yep, I see you so that we're out there. So um, presenters are Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Finkelstad from Naval Postgraduate School and Dr. Robert Hanfield from North Carolina State. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Finkelstad is an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Defense Management at MPS and Dr. Robert Hanfield is the Bank of America University Distinguished Professor of Supply Chain Management at NC State and Director of the Supply Chain Resource Cooperative. And this project has been sponsored by Mr. Michael Pelkey, who's the Acting Director of Contract Policy under the Office of the Principal Decor Director um, Defense Pricing and Contracting. Um, and so I think, are y'all, any of y'all in the room? Ah. Okay, do you want us to say any words? Start off. Okay, so we'll go on ahead and I'll turn it over to uh, to you. I guess, uh, Daniel, you're starting. Yes, yep. Can you hear me over there? <laughs> yes, we can. All right, sounds good. Hey, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dan Finkenstadt, most people call me Fink. Um, we got Rob on the line, Dr. Hanfield. Um, I'm an, like, like they mentioned, I'm an assistant professor here at Naval Postgraduate School, but I teach in the uh, defense management program, primarily Air Force students who are getting their MBA in enterprise sourcing. So traditionally contracting acquisition type folks. Um, so that's sort of the, the angle that we come at this from. Um, let's see here. Let's see if I can share my screen. Can everyone see the, the slides now? I'm hoping that's a yes. <laughs> it kind of, uh, oh, there you go. Yes. There we go. No? All right. Great. So, uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks to the sponsors as well. Um, ANS has been very uh, supportive of what we've been doing since 2021 when we kicked this off as a phase one incubator project um, in combination with NC State. I've been working with Rob and folks at NC State for years, um, uh, even prior to my time here. So, this has been good uh, to continue on. Um, the, the overall motivation for this, looking at games uh, and acquisition, and what are we talking about with training and, and education, gamification? Basically, just taking game elements as a way to, um, to acquire new skills or knowledge, right? To in, in inject things like fantasy or, or goals and, and rules and stuff that you see in a game to teach acquisition-related topics. And the motivation for me to start on this was actually before ARIC even even solicited the idea of looking at different ways to train and educate. I was uh, observing my 14 year old son playing video games that had nothing to do with acquisition or supply chain, but he was telling me all these concepts around resource management and supply chain management and logistics. And I was like, where's this coming from? You know, and he was just learning it from playing these video games. And I was like, huh, you know, these are pretty like bland topics that he's bringing up that he's excited about. And having done 20 years of acquisition education, I was like, yeah, that's a pretty bland topic too that could probably be improved. Through gamification. And so, you know, that's why we're here, right? We need new approaches to improve sort of speed, retention, and mainly the interest piece, right, on some of these topics. Um, what we've been doing from our end uh, is we've been looking at different technology approaches that so far have included video games and digital escape rooms. Uh, so we've prototyped a first person shooter game, um, a digital escape room, uh, arcade games like Pachinko or Endless Runner or Pinball and uh, tower defense games as well. To, and then we've tested the efficacy on one of these games and we've looked at design and mechanics on the others that best fit acquisition related topics. Um, you know, we're, we're exploring these design features that I mentioned, um, some of the best practices. We've got a new report coming out in December, which will lay out sort of the best practices as being a functional designer as part of this team in concert with uh, expert coders from the NC State side. Um, and, you know, we've been just continuously working on looking at potential partners for future game design and research. Um, we have been able to do between group studies at the Air Force Enlisted Tech School, as well as here at MPS. The benefit there is we get actual defense acquisition personnel that are going through training and education, and we can test these modalities out on them and see if they improve over traditional lecture-based instruction. Um, so the current team, as it sits on my side, and I'll let Rob introduce his side, is I'm sitting here as the principal investigator um, <clears throat> working on this project as part of the simulation and ideation lab for applied science, the Silas lab, which was started here. Um, I'm working alongside Dr. Eric Helzer, who's an organizational psychologist um, who's worked in sort of studying the ethics and impacts of gaming for, for education. 
Um, Perry McDowell comes from the Moose Institute here at MPS, which is, if anyone knows, is historically been the the um, the place where we build a lot of live interactive gaming and, and simulation. Um, and then the current research assistants I have are two MBA students, Gage and Jordan. Um, we've had previous MBA students work on these projects as well. So that's for my end, and I'll turn it over to Rob really quickly to introduce the NC State team. Yeah, hi, Rob Hanfield. And, uh, you know, like Fink, I also had a, uh, a son who was an active gamer. Uh, it, it's interesting, he's also a bio major now, and, and they have a lot of virtual environments for uh, studying anatomy in the human body. Um, gaming has come a long way. I, I grew up playing Pong, and that's, that was how sophisticated I was. But it, there's actually, as you'll see, a whole science uh, that's developing around uh, gaming and gaming programming. And uh, one of those experts in that area is Arnav Jala, um, you know, in computer science and was recruited, um, uh, you know, to NC State uh, from the Department of Computer Science, specifically to focus on uh, game design. And he teaches a master's level class uh, and actually has a number of PhD students uh, that are also focused on specific game designs. And it's a very hands-on program. And, and so we're using, um, uh, we're, we're having some of these students actually uh, design some of these games around uh, various modes, um, and we're providing them with, with some of the acquisition uh, concepts that are required. Uh, so Derek Martin is a uh, research assistant, also uh, studying uh, game design, and Marcus Schoner is, is another one working on it. Uh, you know, I should say the local community as well. Uh, North Carolina has a big gaming community, Epic Games, uh, is just down the road, headquartered in Cary, and there's also a, a bunch of startups uh, doing a lot of game design in the area. So, so it's a, a very active community, and there's a, as you'll see, a real science to this as well. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, we've been really fortunate, um, and it's interesting that the MPS uh, Epic Game connection. Uh, you know, previous MPS faculty actually led Epic Games for a while. So it's it's interesting how small the world gets in, in the gaming space. Um, in general though, the, the problem and challenge that we're seeing, like why gaming? Why gaming for defense acquisition? Why would that even matter, right? Other than it just being fun. Um, so we started kind of taking a, a macro view of this. And when you look at this, and this really, you know, was informed by some of the work that Eric Helzer's done um, in organizational psychology, but like defense acquisition spe specialist, we, we operate in this high risk, tightly regulated arena where there's like zero room for defect and high public scrutiny, right? And so all the research around organizational science tells you that that will lead people to, to, to move towards a performance orientation versus a learning orientation, right? Which is basically it's about um, not, explore, not exploring or learning something new, but just making sure you aren't wrong, right? Making sure you aren't wrong to what the right answer should be, right? That's, that's not what we want to get out of our folks here, especially at the graduate level. So the paradox that we face is like, how do our organizations instill this effective, deep, and lifelong learning in these fields where like, if we were to try that out in the real world, it would be perceived as a risk to the ultimate mission, right? And games allow us to sort of overcome that. And that's what we've, we've been looking at. Um, we've sort of taken here and looked at what are the main features of gamified learning? Um, and then what does that do for the environment of a, of a defense acquisition operator, right? Someone who's operating in the defense acquisition space, right? So you think about like this idea of fantasy kind of reduces that real consequence and litigious environment that acquisition folks face. And so that's a good thing for allowing them to explore. But then we have a host of reinforcement mechanisms within game design. Challenges, right? That reinforces complex problem solving. Um, you know, all games have some level of representation, so we have the ability to virtually represent an environment that they may not get exposure to in the day to day, but they may one day need to face uh, curiosity and mystery. Right. Like if anyone's messed with defense acquisition policy or anything around that. Right. There's a constant exploration into like like what are the rules and what happens if. Right. So games allow for that. Um, games allow for for quick feedback uh, and it, it sort of helps us understand like what can happen with like poor performance in an acquisition or the network interactions uh, and definitely rules map perfectly into acquisitions right because we're a heavily regulated area um, but yeah. then the, the 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 other reduction factor is this idea of voluntary participation and mulligans so the idea that you can both choose to perform and, and practice something within a game and then not have uh, a penalty for redoing in the real world right and that allows people to try things they might not otherwise try 
Yeah, and, and just to just to add on to that, uh, you know, I think fear of failure is is something that uh, often of you know prevents people from trying new things in the real world. Um, there's less fear of failure in a game. You know, yeah. you might you might you know get kicked out of the game or something, but uh, you could go ahead and try it again next time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and and this slide is something that, that came out of our very first project that we did here um, that was started by some graduate students uh, in 2021 and wrapped into the ARC project. And I wanna sit on this for a second and let you look at it because it seems very simple. It's probably the simplest slide I have, but it's the most important slide for thinking about this stream of research, right? Because there's sort of this like walking, chewing gum and patting yourself on the head that you have to do when you do one of these projects, which is there, you have to design three things at once. And, and on the different research projects are at varied levels. So you know, because it involves education and training, there's some level of curriculum and learning objective design that has to be done. Sometimes that's given to us pretty, pretty ready to go off the shelf. And sometimes we have to build that in. Then there's the game design itself. So this is sort of the mechanics, the dynamics, the aesthetics, all of that that goes into game design, which is in and of itself a project. And then there's the part where the university comes in, which is research study design. So how do we actually develop a study around this? Because a lot of what you're seeing in the defense world right now around games uh, and things like teaching language or security protocols and all that really aren't worried about the education side of it as much as building a game people like, which can be two different things, right? So we're really not focused as much on becoming the developers of, you know, the next uh, epic game, quality game for defense. It's more about studying how do we inform teams that are going to go build those games and what information can we give them to build the best game for defense acquisition related topics. Um, as we do that, we've, we've sort of bend things into the different types of game studies and the effects. So um, what I mentioned about my son, you know, seeing him pick up all these logistic concepts and resource management concepts, this actually came from these two games that are on the left here, which is Green Hell and Seven Days to Die. One's a zombie game and one's like a survive the, you know, the end of the world type event. And, and these are, are games where there's nothing within the game that has to do with the actual curriculum or the objectives that you want them to learn explicitly. But there's this bleed over effect, right? So they teach concepts of resource management. They teach concepts of logistics uh, inadvertently as part of the game, right? And so is there a way to study that and look at what are those effects? I know, for instance, like Air University right now is really interested in, in this area, which is taking commercial off the shelf games and using them to learn. Um, then there's the game side, Serious and Sim, there's Serious Games and Simulations, which is what people on the DoD are more used to, I think, which is building a simulator of an event or a simulation of an ex experience or a serious related game, which has a little bit more game interactive dynamics, but is still focused around a realistic environment. And then the, the third one is what we, we did initially here with Sandbox Contracting, the video game that was developed, actually, believe it or not, by a defense management student who just had wicked game skills. Uh, he actually put one out, which is the first person shooter, uh, which is in, in engagement, it takes the player to a fantasy environment, which is semi non-realistic, but teaches real curriculum information. So the actual information is being displayed in the game. Um, when we did the, uh, the first person shooter uh, uh, sandbox contracting game, we were able to take that to the uh, Air Force enlisted tech school, as well as do one wave of study here at MPS and look at the results of uh, both a pre and post. So basically the students were given a pretest. They were exposed to either, uh, they were split randomly into control and treatment groups. The control group um, just went through a standard lecture and the treatment group actually played the game for the same period of time. And then they took a post test and we looked for differences in their scores across that. Now the first four waves were down at the enlisted tech school and involve what we call the one-to-one -one question modality. So the pre-test, the information within the game, and the post-test were all one-for-one -one questions. The final test that we did here at NPS was to try something a little more complex, and we used category management as a topic, and we used derivative questions, which was the pre- and post-test questions were essentially the same, but the information within the game was not a one-for-one -one, uh, question and answer. It was, if you could learn what's in the game, it should help you answer the questions in the post-test, if that makes sense. Right, and what we saw with that is that there was better improvement through gaming um, versus lecturing versus the one-to-one -one modality. Also of note, down at the tech, tech school, we learned that they had a lot of issues with um, sort of having uh, like poor hard, uh, excuse me, poor hardware, so they couldn't actually run the high-level graphics in the game. So we had to strip it back, which made the experience less enjoyable. Um, and they were sort of set because of the classroom environment in like a a one to, like a singular 
they weren't allowed to interact with other players where we allowed them to interact with other players during our time here at MPS and we saw a different uh, performance. In, that. in terms of actual experiences, and, and this is pretty indicative of what you see in the, the gaming literature, is that if you do a pre and post results on performance, you don't see the gaming folks overwhelmingly outperform the standard instruction. It's more that they're excited about it and enjoy it, right? So if you look at the, the bottom right, you'll see that, that most people said that they would want to learn outside of the classroom using these methods. Um, if you look at the net promoter score results, which is sort of like, are they, um, you know, if they're in the orange, they're basically detractors, which means they would tell people not to use this modality. If they're in the yellow, that means they're unopinionated. And if they're in the green, it means they would promote people to use this modality of learning. Um, we saw that with the treatment group, we had a little bit more of either you're a full detractor or you're a full promoter. Um, and we learned a lot about uh, uh, this concept of mandatory play and some people who don't enjoy gaming, if you put them in that gaming environment, they're gonna have a very negative experience. So it's an interesting learning uh, piece for us on designing an experiment. You, you typically want to randomize people into groups, but if you randomize someone who doesn't wanna play a video game into a video game, you're gonna get negative experience results, I think, from that. So that was definitely a, um, a learning experience from us, but this study was really geared around the uh, uh, efficacy of gamified learning. Um, looking back now at the mechanics side and actually designing a game, what we've recently been doing is actually conducting a study to build two things. One is a, a tower defense game, which I'll discuss, and an escape room, which really wasn't so focused uh, in the early stages on what's its efficacy on learning acquisition topics. It was more of like, how do you take acquisition topics and design the proper mechanics for a game? And so these are a deep dive study into actually like a case analysis of being a functional design expert from an acquisition space, working with computer scientists and understanding like what are the mechanic considerations, the dynamic considerations and the aesthetic considerations that need to go in that. And it's interesting because our acquisition personnel at MPS are traditionally from the player side. So they basically interact with the game by seeing the aesthetics first, then playing with the dynamics and the underlying mechanics allow that to operate. Whereas a designer typically looks the other way, which is they think about the underlying mechanics to create a dynamic that allows for an aesthetic for the player. And so by having the computer scientist at, MPS, or at uh, NC State, along with our acquisition experts at NPS, we're able to sort of experience that from both directions. Um, what NC State's also been able to offer is this idea of taking typical mechanics that you would you would want to expose defense acquisition people to based on skills we might want them to have and mapping that on to a whole group of different games that are all already available. So these are games when we talk about exposure gaming, just exposing them to a game that might teach certain skills. NC State is already mapping that out onto what games already teach things like communication, logistics, problem solving, spatial reasoning, right? And so they've been able to do this across, like, I think over 50 video games so far. And then this taxonomy types I'll talk about in a moment, which is sort of what type of players would like this type of game mechanic as well. Uh, in terms of recent builds, uh, we've started building a tower defense style game, uh, which they've uh, named Project Admiral which allows players to sort of build out a base and consider some of the con concepts of operational contract support in a contingency environment and the sourcing decisions that are made and, and what that has to do with resources. So what you see to the right is sort of the decision tree that the contracting students have put together to inform the computer scientist at NC State on how to build out the game and, and the mechanic of choosing things between an SF-44 or a blanket purchasing agreement or an IDIQ. And the way they've sort of designed it is you make these choices, some of them give you resources immediately, but they don't last as long. And they require, you know, uh, some, some require more COs to do this, but they give you more resources in the long term. And so they're working and playing with that mechanic of the trade-offs that occur during a contingency learning environment um, to make it more fun, you know, and interactive. And of course they take it to a fantasy element. They're not dealing with uh, a, an environment where it's um, traditional military uh, or contemporary military. They're, they're looking at more of like, you know, sort of the, the old, uh, the fantasy environment with knights and stuff like that. Um, the other game, which has been really interesting that we've built out a lot further and been able to test out for game mechanics um, is it sort of rides at the line of serious games, uh, uh, engagement gaming, as well as escape rooms. And escape rooms are sort of its own thing because most people have studied escape room education from physical escape rooms and, and playing in teams. We were somewhat limited on uh, 
on capital to build out a physical escape room. So we thought, hey, we could talk to NC State about building out a digital one. And they've been able to do this. And this is the, the game known as Sinking Ship, which has uh, a ship that you're on. It's under attack. It starts to sink. And you have to make your way through five different rooms by getting the key code to the door through these five different puzzles. And the curriculum that we chose was um, protest cases, protest rules, FAR Part 33. So there's a host of questions in this, in this question bank. And it also combines puzzles for learning. So the students are tested with cipher-based puzzles. Um, they actually have to read through in another room an entire GAO protest case and have to fi figure out that it's the actual geography of where the case takes place and ma match that to a map. Um, we have a true and false room, which is essentially they have to learn that it's this cutting on and off of lanterns. Um, they get really complex on the matching of clauses and, and processes to part 33 and then mapping that to a color code. Uh, and then the final room is this, this puzzle treasure chest where you get asked open uh, sort of fill in the blank questions and you have to respond to those by picking the right medallion and matching it to a chest to, to get the code to open the door. So it combines the learning of the curriculum, the engagement of the game and the complexity of puzzles. What traditional escape room um, literature will tell you, at least what's come out since like the, the 2020s, is when you're doing educational escape rooms, these puzzles can't get too complex and you can't involve too much stuff in each room or they'll miss out on learning the actual uh, curriculum itself. So next steps for these games are to build them out further and then test efficacy as well versus just the optimal way to design the mechanic, if that makes sense. Um, what we've seen so far, we are able to measure sort of um, in two waves student experiences um, with how easy, fun, or replayable each game is. So keep in mind, this is on the game design side of the research. This isn't on the um, education side. This is understanding what type of games meet the intent for the player so that we can then start testing, okay, now let's mix in the curriculum that, you know, and see how they're learning from it. But overall, we've had pretty um, positive feedback on fun and replayability for most of the rooms. Um, some of them are easier or harder than others. And that the easy one is one of those where you kind of want to play with it a little bit, which is you don't necessarily want to have the easiest room possible because that takes away from some of the challenge. But what this does help us with ease is know what order to put the rooms in because you kind of want them to elevate with difficulty as you go. You don't want them to face the hardest room first and feel like they want to back out of playing the game entirely for learning. Um, where we're headed next, one of the biggest things that we've learned from previous gaming education, as well as what we need from seeing the DoD build games without studying games and, and, and other federal agencies build games without studying games, is we need a massive player type uh, research uh, study to look at what are the overarching player types um, within defense acquisition to, to build out the best game that we can then take to that work that NC State's done on mapping mechanics to skills to gamer types, then we can start sort of getting that three-dimensional look at what we should be investing in for game design and building for education and training. Um, you know, talking to other folks up the street, like we have the Defense Language Institute up the street. If you look up, they they just uh, mainstreamed a game called Mage Duel, which teaches language through sort of this fantasy fireball thing. You like, you translate language, you get energy, you're able to solve problems and, and fight off bad guys with that. Um, they kind of like had to go through a really difficult learning process from talking to them where they started off with a first person shooter such that we did because it's traditionally considered a very popular game, but then found out that their, their students don't prefer that at all. They want more of the fantasy element. And so instead of sort of making those, uh, those sunk cost investments in this games that may not be the best, we're saying, hey, let's move out with a game player type uh, study early on and figure out what the overarching gamer types are that we should be building. And that's where we're moving out with our phase two um, and our draft scope modules, which is, you know, the very first one we want to do for phase two is a player type study um, for acquisition experts. Uh, we want to keep working on the computer-based escape room and, and test its efficacy and then potentially move it into the virtual reality space. There is an opportunity to make it a VR-based game. Uh, the operational contract support defense, a tower defense game still needs a lot of building out. And so uh, we'd like to finish building that and test the efficacy of it as well and continue to build uh, uh, case studies such as like negotiation case studies and stuff that can be built into uh, simulated experiences with games. Uh, yeah, as part that, of the game and as part of that, you know, I think uh, negotiation is a great opportunity to, you know, look at a number of different contractual elements mm -hmm. and uh, actually helping them construct the contract uh, out of that negotiation as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've seen different types of games being built out there. Um, uh, everywhere from like the Army's game, which is essentially just running you through a simulation of reviewing documents, um, uh, which is basically just a virtual uh, contract file review experience, to DAU's, um, uh, I think it's called MindShift, which is basically a software factory. Uh, it's built in a tycoon style game. And so we've got to experience those games as well. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going out there with game builds and designs. But what we're trying to really add some value and get ARC involved in is, is testing the efficacy and sort of the, the science behind what we're doing uh, in this space. So I think, yeah, I think that's my last slide. Um, uh, you know, Rob, I don't know if you have any closing comments. We're excited about this. We're having a lot of fun. Naval Postgraduate School, we do a lot of stuff with games and simulations. NC State does as well. Um, we're, we're, we're doing some other things within the Silas Lab, if you're interested as well, uh, in the digital space. But from the gaming perspective, that's what we've been working on. Yeah, just a, a final comment. I think, um, you know, this, this is very new territory for us. Uh, you know, most of the gaming has been done around sort of war gaming simulations, but actually using it for acquisition learning is uh, is really new. So we're any and all suggestions are obviously welcome. Thank you. We got a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Fink and team. This is John Tenegli. I just wanted to thank you for uh, taking this research on. Uh, one observation I had about, and you were talking about the uh, how this translates to uh, helping people get ready for negotiation it strikes me is uh, one of the uh, useful aspects of gaming might be the interaction you get, particularly where we have distance learning that's that's become more of the norm now. So uh, putting people in buyer and seller roles and having them oppose each other. Uh, and certainly I welcome your further development of that in, in the pricing and negotiation area. But uh, that strikes me as a uh, uh, something that really sink in with our students. So thank you for taking this on. Yeah, absolutely, sir. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. So what you're talking about there is, is the player interaction, which we're hearing a lot people want more of. And then there's also a level of competition. So every game that we've built, and we put forward to a person, they've all walked up and said, I want a leaderboard. I want like, I want badges. I want to be able to be better than the other people I'm playing against. So I think that's a, a key, key point to that negotiation exercise. And you're exactly right, sir. That's a, a way we could bring that in for sure. Yeah, and I think there's another question um, online. Uh, Mike Pelkey asks, are you coordinating with DAU so that your research is supportive of their needs, both in curriculum and game design? So we have. Um, we actually did a Hacking for Defense project for DAU on their MindShift game last year, where we sort of did a user experience, user interface study for them and went through that and sort of help give them advice on what our students were seeing as users of it, as well as what they knew from gamer research. Um, what I've seen from most activities is, um, and this is where I really want to be clear, because it's so easy to get excited about building games. It really is. But the reality is, is Naval Postgraduate School is not going to be the builder of the best video games, right? We're just not, right? NC State's probably a little closer to it than we are, but being there with Epic Games, but we're surely not. What we want to do is be the folks that understand how that modality of education and training impacts defense acquisition topics, right? And to be sort of hand in hand with the developers so that we can really learn that and inform people who invest in it. What you see with DAU, um, DLI, Air University, is they're outsourcing the game build to someone else. And they're really focused on their bread and butter, which is curriculum development. And how do they translate that curriculum into this game that someone else is building and then just hoping it works? And I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm just, they'll tell you to, they'll say like, you know, we haven't put money aside for efficacy studies. Like we're just going to go field it and see how it works from like an experiential, like, hey, what do you think about it? Are you using it? What we're trying to show is like there's value in studying gamer types in advance. So you design that in and then there's value on the backside of doing an efficacy study to say, like, is this actually giving us what we want? Because we have experts here that aren't game designers and aren't acquisition experts, but they are experts in um, like virtual education and using technology for education. And a lot of them, if you, they read the literature, is like, hey, gaming can go really south, which is you get the students so focused on the game that they don't learn the topic. And so you really have to know how you're blending that and you have to study that in the build uh, and even know how to put that into the statement of work that that's a requirement to do an efficacy study and to optimize that for outcomes versus just, you know, cool factor. And it also depends on if you want like if DAU or whoever wants to use that game to replace traditional instruction, which means efficacy matters more than ever, 
or if they want it as an augmentation function, which is where I think it has the most value, which is to keep curiosity and excitement around the topic. Um, so our last question, Q&A, is just a comment. Mark Blackburn writes, we've been trying to use game technology for graphical con ops in system design, and we've had some good results with that. Um, based on comments this morning on challenges for con ops, you might have good skills for that process too. Um, so I think that's just a note to let's collaborate. Um, I know the CERC also did a large program called the, the System Engineering Experience Accelerator, which was a game-based tool that DAU used. And so I think, you know, I, I think just to note that there's actually a lot of opportunity for us to collaborate further. Yeah, and I would say, you know, keep keep your ear to the ground on other people. We're, we're approached all the time by folks like Air University has a whole group of people in the Dagger program that are looking at developing people with games. Uh, and so we're trying to stay tied into them as, as part of NPS and NC State um, and, and keeping the network going. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the, the thesis that our current students are going to put out that involves the, the escape room work and the defense tower game, our tower defense game, I think is a very, very useful study. Um, because whereas the previous study took the game design as given and just studied the effects of it on curriculum, this game really takes a deep dive into how do you take a concept like defense acquisition and design a game around it. It's a very design-based study and, and the concepts of, it takes through two really deep case studies of being part of those teams. And so I think it, it ends up giving a roadmap for a lot of folks from any type of functional activity that wants to build games for their education and training plans. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we're at a break now. So um, 